feels like evening, so maybe uh, that would be appropriate. I'm, uh, I'm Ned Decker, a professor and chair of the Department of Natural Resources. And for this, uh, this afternoon, this evening's program, I'm going to serve as the MC, which means I've got to keep track of time and make sure the professors don't talk too long, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, we're, we're gathered here, of course, in, for this event to acknowledge the uh, career and the generosity of Dr. Ann Labastille, a distinguished alumna from our department. She received both, both her bachelor's and her PhD in natural resources. Hey, Dan? Yeah. Speak Is up. there any chance of getting the mic mm. up a little higher? Uh, I, don't on. On. <laughs> I don't know if it's on. I'll yell at it. <laughs> yell it out. Yeah, I will. So, um, I think we're going to hear a little bit about different kinds of interactions, either the people have had with, uh, with Ann. I, I remember my very, I, I had two that I can remember that I'm going to start off with before I introduce our, our first really uh, formal speaker. Uh, one was when I was an undergraduate student here about 1971. I uh, had a class in wild conservation, which Neil probably recalls, and Ann was the, uh, was the um, guest speaker for that course. I remember it quite clearly because it was very rare that we had a female wildlife biologist uh, speaking to our class in 1970s, early 1970s. So that was a memorable experience. My next, to fast forward, and my next interaction with Ann I can recall, the last example again, was when I was department chair the first time through. I'm going through a second time so I can they want to get it right this time. <laughs> so anyway, well, the first time I was department chair about 20 uh, years ago, and Ann came to make, uh, made a visit on campus. I really don't recall who it was she was here to, to see uh, exactly, but my job, my formal job as department chair when she was here was to be a dog sitter. Yes. And I had two, <laughs> I took care of two Jerry Shepherds in my office. Well, she met with the important people on campus, probably Milo and whatever. So uh, that was my second experience with me. Yeah, of course, I saw her several times after that, but it was, it was sort of all well, my memories here. Um, of course, Anne passed away in 2011, but through her will, um, she remembered her alma mater, and we're uh, now uh, she provided funding for the Woods Woman Scholarship Fund. And you've got materials here that you picked up, so I won't go into a great uh, detail on that, but the purpose of that fund is going to be to, or is, to provide uh, financial assistance for female graduate students in, uh, in conservation and natural resources. So we're really pleased and honored that we're going to have, the, we have the role of sort of seeing that happen on her behalf. We're administering that, that purpose. So it's really great. And we're here to sort of commemorate that a bit and kick it off. Uh, and with that, then, I'd like to so move to our next speaker, and that's uh, Dr. Jim Lasoy. Uh, for those of you who don't know Jim, Jim's a, a, a longtime professor in the Department of Natural Resources. Um, and he's included many, uh, he's had many kinds of roles here and kinds of service for the department, the college, and the university. One of those was also to be the board chair uh, once or twice. And uh, I think that it's probably during that, one of those periods during the, uh, the late 1980s that uh, he came to, to know and begin to work with uh, Ann Lovis. So maybe share a few comments about those experiences. Thank you, Dan. And uh, folks, it's really, uh, it's really great to see such a diverse group of people and just a, it's a cross-section I think of who Anne Bastille was uh, that you showed up today and her influence on so many people for so many decades and uh, um, I think the uh, it's really a pleasure to be part of this program and to kind of acknowledge to acknowledge and, and uh, you know, um, celebrate Anne's life and what contribution she made uh, to conservation, uh, to this department and its students and faculty, and to the and to the college, I'm really thankful to have an opportunity to share just a few comments with you before we get into the real program and the real meat uh, of that. Um, the um, it was interesting. I've got quite a thick <laughs> file drawer full of uh, information about Anne Bastille over the years I've worked with her. Uh, 
And I found in there a, a card, <clears throat> her, her calling card, and I found it quite interesting when I looked at it in reflection. It, of course, says West of the Wind Publications, Inc. Under it, Anne LaBastille, PhD, President. There's two German shepherds on the side, <laughs> pictures. Uh, Westport address, and a phone fax number only. No email address. No, and uh, that you could contact her between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Underneath it says ecological consulting, writing, lecturing, wilderness guiding. And I found that quite interesting and what we'll do, I'm sure, the rest of the, of the evening tonight when we share stories about Anne is to kind of unpack all of those things that was on her uh, professional card. Uh, as Dan said, I, 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 I kind of forget when I first met Anne, you know, which is not, she was certainly uh, uh, not forgettable, but, um, you know, I think it reflects more of the aging process and in my interactions <laughs> with Anne. I think he's right, it was in the late 80s when I was uh, <coughs> department chair and she showed up uh, and I started to uh, uh, interactions that lasted, uh, you know, for the next 25 years. Um, the, uh, those were, you know, both on a personal level as well as a professional level, because Anne didn't really separate those two. And, you know, her professional life was really a big part of her personal life and vice versa. So it was very uh, interesting. Uh, I was fortunate to uh, spend a lot of time with her uh, here on campus at Ruth and My Home in West Danby, where she often stayed, uh, at uh, 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 her house in Westport, and then at uh, Big Bear Lake at her cabin, you know, the, the one that she built in Woods Woman, the first book in 1976, which interestingly was the year I came here to campus, uh, was her first book. Um, I also helped uh, uh, found, we found in, uh, oh, a, a big part of it was Ruth and I had the opportunity to travel with Ann to Lake Achilan and spend 10 days at the lake with her, going back to where she did her PhD work with her. And it was, you know, truly a, an amazing experience to uh, be with Woods Woman and her, uh, you know, where she had so many important things uh, happen over so many years. Uh, I helped her put together a private foundation, a small NGO, and raise money uh, to work back in at the lake, you know, specifically to help improve conservation on the lake for four or five years that ran that uh, we did quite a bit of work. Uh, I did some research work for for Jaguar Totem, uh, the book that she published in 1999. Uh, I did the research because I had access to the internet. Those of you know, Anne didn't really uh, embrace computer technology and was amazed at how many things I could find uh, <laughs> from my computer while we were researching them. Also, uh, 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 I helped her sponsor and come back to campus a number of times. I recall uh, when she came back and gave the the uh, giant greed story, which you know was very touching, that followed the extinction of the species on Lake I Lake Achilan and her, where she did her her research. There were also any time when she published a new book, uh, she was on campus to for readings and signings, either here or at the bookstore, and she ran at least one or maybe two student writers workshops where she mentored for two days students in writing for popular uh, outlets and all of that. So I want to wrap up by just telling a couple of, a, a couple of stories that really identified, uh, to, for me, uh, identified Anne. First was uh, Ruth Sherman, my wife and I, we went up to Westport to visit Anne one summer and we arrived about an hour after a torrential downpour, you know. And so we pulled into Ann's old farmhouse driveway, and Ann was out with her mud boots on, uh, writing all of her corn plants that had been knocked over with, and putting a stick there. And so she was time, saw them, came over, we did the, 
did the hug thing and she walked onto the porch and she sat down and pulled off her mud boots and her toenails were painted. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it just, I, I don't know, I've never, I forgot, and it just struck me about here's Woods Woman, you know, and that rustic elegance, you know, and class of someone who's not afraid to go out and dig in the mud and do all these kinds of things on that, but then took the care you know, of a good pedicure and, uh, you know, and uh, all that. So, you know, that was a real defining moment. Second one was, was one of her um, uh, uh, short courses she did on writing. I had a student come the second day and complained. Okay, well, turned out he'd gone to a party that night and couldn't show up the next day, you know, because it started at promptly at 7.30 in the morning. And he complained about how kind of uh, uh, eccentric Anne was and how she demanded, what she demanded of writers. And he complained about that and talked to me for a few minutes as department chair about, you know, working with Anne LaBastille. And I said, well, what if you had the opportunity, you had the chance to spend two days with John Muir, Henry David Thoreau, Aldo Leopold, would you take that opportunity? <laughs> yeah, well, of course. And I said, well, do you think that they'd just be common, normal kinds of individuals? <laughs> and, you know, and conventional kinds of professor kinds of people? And uh, I think we communicated very well. <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, and so, you know, I mean, we know what, what Anne did. She defined conservation in the Adirondacks. And, and I think nationally uh, as well as internationally, but she also defined a place for women in wilderness and conservation. And um, after death, I had, uh, uh, there was some money left over in the, um, in the foundation, not very much, you know, we never operated on very much, but it came to the university, uh, came to the department, and so kind of in her spirit for the next, the last, three, four, five years, whatever it's been, three or four years, um, I've been using that money to support women in conservation. You know, when a student came to the department and um, was going to a conference or something and was looking for money, that's where that, that kind of money went. I also funded, we also funded a couple of males, I wasn't, <laughs> but most of it went to women in conservation. So, uh, that's what we're going to talk about. And that's what we're going to hear about today. You know, all of that complex life that made up uh, who we all knew was in the best deal. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next guest is uh, Dr. Max Pfeffer, a professor in development sociology here, also senior associate dean in the College of Life Sciences. Uh, that means he's my boss. Uh, and he, he wants to share a few, few comments from the perspective of the college on and scholarship, her contributions to the institution of the New York State. Thanks, Dan. It's really nice to see everybody here, uh, especially you, Dick. I'm really pleased to see you here tonight, really. And it's really nice. It's, it's just great to be here. Everybody says that. Dan said this, Jim said this, this is not the real show, and I'll say the same thing again. I'm not going to take too much of your time. <laughs> Leslie's going to provide the real uh, talk here in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but um, I'm pleased to, to be here. And I'm here to, to um, bring warm regards from Dean Catherine Moore to all of you, and to, on her behalf and uh, on behalf of the entire faculty of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences to welcome you here uh, this evening. Uh, we're uh, really pleased to be able to pay tribute to Anne Lava Steele uh, for her scholarship, her uh, service in public life, and also for her uh, generosity in enabling us to establish the Wisdom Scholarship Fund. So we're really grateful for that. Uh, the uh, support and advancement of women uh, uh, through scholarship is something that's very close and very important to the university and to the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Uh, the Woods uh, Woman Scholarship Fund uh, is going to be an important uh, uh, way for us to pursue our uh, strategic objective in the college of creating greater diversity uh, amongst in our students, faculty, and staff. So it's a kind of central 
uh, for our college. So it's, it's really appropriate to pay um, tribute to Anne uh, today. She was a leader uh, in natural resources uh, throughout her career, as Jim has already pointed out. And she was a good example of how someone have, can have great impact on many, many people through her scholarship, uh, her writing and public service, and, and not to uh, mention uh, by setting an example and impacting the world. Uh, she had a great uh, impact. Uh, certainly here, we're grateful for those impacts uh, if nothing else, that it always reflected very favorably on Cornell. And as Dan mentioned, she has two degrees from here, and I think it's a very important alumna uh, for all of us. Um, she was a, a pathbreaker, and was a pathbreaker. She completed her uh, PhD research in Guatemala. Uh, she studied the pipe built breed, and later advocated for its protection. Very important. Uh, one of the things uh, I think that she wanted to do was prevent the extinction of that bird. And that was one of the few things that she did not succeed at in her career. Uh, now, the written stories about meeting Anne, I was privileged to meet her, it was thanks to you. Uh, you. You probably don't remember this, those are the kinds of things you're forgetting. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm sorry to forget how to open the doors. <laughs> I can help you with that. Uh, I'm not far behind you there. But I do remember this. It might be a fiction that you know I've kind of come up with things sometimes. But no, I really remember this. I remember meeting her, and, and it was uh, it was the time when we had the uh, Cornell uh, Institute for Food Agriculture and Development, and we were kind of pushing into Central America to start some program. We were involved in that. We brought her around, and, and then we talked about her work in Guatemala and the Tico and there and everything. And so that was I remember that very very well. And I remember at the time being struck by, look, this woman, we're just getting going here. She had already been doing this in the 1960s. And that she's already been uh, uh, working hard to make an impact. And she had been working on uh, creating a habitat, protected habitat for that bird. And, and, and advocating for that. And succeeded in that, actually. Having to create a protected area from there. But I thought that was really important. Now, of course, she, her role as a commissioner in the uh, Adirondack Park Agency had a it was impressive to me, and I think it was really uh, an important thing. And I think, in general, brings to the kind of the topic of her presence in the Adirondacks and how significant uh, that was. And there's a few things I would note about that. One, I think I'm struck by the fact that she was working first in Lake Atitlan in Guatemala and uh, with the Adirondack Park Agency. And I think one of the things that struck me about that is that she realized at an early stage that uh, conservation uh, was a global challenge. And I think in that way, she was ahead of many environmentalists in the United States, already thinking uh, kind of globally at that time. So that was one thing. Uh, second, I think her, uh, she put her knowledge and her values about nature uh, to work in public service while she was commissioner. She did that for 17 years, I believe. And so that was a very significant uh, impact. And finally, um, her uh, philosophy and personal experience with nature while living in the Adirondacks became an example for many, many people through the Woods Woman series, which we, Jim has already mentioned, which is very important. I think we have examples over here on the table. Uh, so she played a role at that time, uh, I think, very significant as a public intellectual. You know, somebody out there reflecting, uh, sharing that experience, and having an impact on people's lives. So that was another thing, I think. And I, I think I could go on here about her many, many contributions uh, in different areas of, of uh, uh, scholarship and public life, but we could go on and on after and I won't do that. But I want to end here uh, with the observation that Anne was a superb role model for many young people, especially women. And that's what Jim was pointing out before. She was a scholar, she was a public intellectual, a public servant, and an act activist in the conservation realm. And on top of that, uh, she was a generous supporter of scholarship. So for all of these reasons, I think it's completely appropriate that we're paying tribute to him at Namaste this afternoon. So thank you very much.
And as folks have alluded to, our next speaker is our featured speaker really tonight, um, <coughs> and that's Leslie Surprenant. Um, Leslie's leader of the Invasive Species Coordination Unit in the um, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And through that role, several of us here in the room uh, know Leslie, we've uh, had the opportunity to interact with her or work with her in, in the past. Um, Leslie's also the executrix for in uh, Love of Skills, the State of Wolf. And uh, it's, uh, she, in that capacity, she's been great help to us in setting up the uh, Woods Woman um, Scholarship Fund. So that's been much appreciated. We really want to express that to you, Leslie, for all that effort. And we know it was a lot of effort to do that. Um, I think uh, tonight we're going to give Leslie a few minutes to talk about Anne and her experiences, which I think we're going to learn go back quite a way in, in Leslie's uh, personal life and, and history. Maybe it's even been transformational in that, that relationship. So uh, would you join me in welcoming our guest? Thank you. Thank you. So I did want to give folks a couple minutes. If you are sitting next to a chair that is empty, would you put your hand up so some of the folks here can get a chair? And then I'm going to try to do this without the microphone. But please, if you can't hear me, please speak up. Uh, and so, you know, Ann told me the reason she wore pink toenail polish was to cover her dirty toenails because she hardly ever wore shoes. <laughs> like, never wore shoes. So. I, so I, I guess I, I didn't mean to start that I was going to start with a story, but other folks started with the first time they met Anne. My first recollection of having met Anne was I, uh, I was on a snowmobile trip, and I was too young to drive a snowmobile on the road. We'd been in the woods, and I was driving in the woods, and then we got out to a road, and we're up by, uh, on the Stillwater Road in the western Adirondacks, and then my grandmother had to drive. Well, we hit a patch of ice, and the first thing my grandmother did was slam on the brakes, and we spun around and had a big snowmobile wreck and broke the windshield on our snowmobile. And so it was uh, r mighty cold, as it, is in the, you know, as it is now, but colder than now. And we had to make the, our way the rest of the trip with no windshield. And if you ever snowmobiled with no windshield, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's no fun. And so I was, I would say, 9 or 10 years old. We get out to an intersection, and there's Anne LaBastille in her pickup truck, and she never, by the way, she never drove a car. I never saw her drive a car in my life. It was always a pickup truck. And so then she had this big dog that was that dog right there, Pizzi. And she saw this, you know, freezing cold kid. She said, you get in my truck right now. It's nice and warm. And you cuddle up to that big dog. He is not going to hurt you. So that was my first uh, <laughs> recollection of meeting in. So um, I guess I, to advance a slide, so I, I think I can do this. So. So for those of you who knew who she was, I think you've gotten a pretty good background. Uh, she was truly a trailbreaker. For those uh, of you who knew her, I think you're going to learn a lot more tonight. And for those of you who never uh, knew her or knew of her, you're going to learn about an amazing woman. She wrote uh, over a dozen popular books, including the Woods Woman series and uh, uh, Ecology series, over 150 uh, popular articles, and over 25 scientific articles. So, and uh, was born Mariette LaBastille. Uh, she hated that name, and when I first knew her, she told me, don't you ever tell anybody that's my name. And so it was our secret, but when her best friend wrote her obituary, it came out. So now I can say that her name was Maria Anne LaBastille, and she greeted the world November 20th, 1933, and uh, she was a single child. She was born in New York City. Uh, she grew up in Montclair, New Jersey, and uh, I'm going to talk, I'm going to spend some time talking about her parents and about the interesting family background that she comes from, but both of her parents came from rather large families, and uh, they were, the one characteristic that goes, or the several characteristics that go through both of those families is that they were very accomplished, there were a lot of eccentrics, there were engineers, architects, intellectuals, and a treasure hunter. It was a real heritage of intellect, hard work, persistence, and just really kind of oddball characters. And um, follow, you're going to find some common threads as I, as I uh, carry you through this biography of Anne. And you, there's a, I'm going to talk about her heritage and some common threads. And I think it's going to give you some insight into how she became 
the person that she was. So this is her, her mom and dad and her as a, as a little baby. On her father's side of the family was Sir William Phipps. He was born uh, in Maine in 1650. He became a treasure hunter in the West Indies, and it was funded by the British monarchy. Uh, he uh, discovered a um, sunken treasure. It was the largest Spanish galleon ever, and it was loaded with thousands and thousands of pieces of 25 karat gold, 22, 22 and a half karat gold. And in 1600s dollars, he recovered over $3 million in treasure, and that was 1600s dollars. So he had made this bargain with the monarchy of Britain, and he, he paid their cut, and he became really famous and really rich all of a sudden. And he was honored. The king appointed him to be the first governor of Massachusetts. He was knighted by the king. And it turned out that he was a much better treasure hunter than he was politician. <laughs> he uh, got into all sorts of controversies. He actually set up the, uh, he was in power when the um, Salem witch trials came. He, saw, he set them up, he saw them running amok, he shut them down. Nonetheless, he created so much chaos, he was called back to England for corruption. But Anne was, uh, Anne was very proud that this, um, this man's blood ran in her veins. Jumping ahead about 200 years, on Anne's mother's side, this is uh, Anne's grandfather on her mother's side, Julius Goebel. Uh, he was her grandfather. And he was uh, quite a character. He uh, came to America when he was 15 years old with his parents. Uh, he, after the Astro-Prussian War, his family was not going to uh, swear allegiance to a king. He was, had a PhD. He was a professor in German studies. And he uh, was among the earliest professors at Stanford University when Stanford first started. But he had, was very proud of his German ancestry. And he tramped through the hills of Germany with a zither, you know, a musical instrument under his arm. And he collected folk tales and folk music throughout Germany. And he was really passionate about ethics and about philosophy and really passionate about German uh, culture. And he wanted to make sure German culture uh, stayed in America, remained in America. So he, had, he was really ethical. He had these super high academic standards. And he was a firebrand. And he was hated by his adversaries, and he was adored by his admirers, much like Anne. So he, was, he arrives at Stanford University early on, but he realizes that he gets really critical of the university. He said, there's no original research, very little. There's internal spying. And he just said, you know, this is all substandard. And in, somewhere in the, in the meantime, uh, Mr. Stanford died, and so his wife Jane was the one left. It was, it was started by Leland and Jane Stanford. And so Leland dies, and so the head of the college, Dave Jordan was his name, hated Julius Goebel. And so Jane Stanford made David Jordan invite Julius Goebel to a fancy um, faculty dinner. And he did it, but he was plenty unhappy about doing it. And a couple weeks later, Mrs. Stanford tastes something pretty funny in her water. And she was convinced she was being poisoned. So she hastens away on vacation to Hawaii. And of course, she's in California, so it's not that far. But hasten in those days meant a freighter boat. So she goes by freighter boat to Hawaii. And she did die there a few weeks later. And the coroner did rule it strychnine poisoning. So David Jordan hastens to Hawaii again on a freighter, and he brings somebody with him, and together they issued a press release that said, Jane Stanford died of natural causes. And then he hastens his way back to California and promptly fired Julius Goebel, and it created international protests. It was a really big deal, and it, um, it was all about academic freedoms. And it stands to this day as one of a couple of cases that are studied about academic freedoms. It was very, very difficult for Julius Goebel to get another job. He worked a little bit at, at Harvard, and while he was trying to get a job at Harvard, the big earthquake hit in, um, in California, and I actually have come across the letter from Anne's grandmother writing to dear Julius, my beloved, 
this is awful. I have the kids living up on the, the um, tennis court, the house we can't go into. So it's this real heart-rendering letter. So in any case, he had a really hard time getting a job, and it took Teddy Roosevelt intervened to get him a job, and he ended up at Illinois State University. Uh, Anne's parents, Ferdinand Labastille and Irma Goebel, also known as Kate Thornhill, and I'll tell you why, and sh she's Kate in a minute, but uh, Ferdinand, uh, he had five siblings, and all except for one was born in Haiti. He was born in Haiti, and a lot of these folks, they immigrated to the United States and Brazil, and they were engineers and architects and that, and uh, his um, brother started Brazil's largest airline. So they were really, you know, like this real, you know, German engineering, German intellect kind of a family. Uh, Ferdinand became a citizen in 1921, and he had his bachelor's degree from Illinois State University and his master's degree from Columbia. He was also a professor in German studies, and he was uh, described by one of Anne's cousins as a sweet, cultured, very, you know, refined and gentle man. Uh, Irma, her mom, she had a big family. She had six siblings, and they were all educated in, at the uh, Illinois State University. She became a famous concert pianist, and I think that's about all Ann ever told me about her mom is she was a famous concert pianist and the only woman stevedore in the United States. So she was a lecturer and a performer, and I'm going to talk more on her a little bit later, but um, her siblings, uh, they were very accomplished as well, uh, Uncle Julius, um, her brother, became a legal scholar and historian at Columbia University. Uh, her brother, Uncle Walter, became a um, biochemist at Rockefeller University, and he was known for his research on polysaccharides. And uh, her sister, Aunt Marie, became a historian and biographer of Thomas Jefferson. So Irma was born in uh, California, like I said, she could speak five languages by the time she was eight. Uh, she studied music at Illinois State University and then the University of Berlin in Germany. She was a renowned pianist throughout Europe and the United States. And uh, she also researched rare folklore stories throughout Latin America and Central America. And she did that for 25 years. And remember, her father did the same thing in Germany. Now she's doing it in Latin America and Central America. She's collecting folk stories. She's collecting folk songs. She's collecting and purchasing period attire. And she would come back to the United States, and she would, she would do these. Um, I forgot to switch slides. She would do uh, a lot of uh, concerts and performances. And she and Ferdinand wanted to bring Central American and South American culture to North America and have sort of a One America look through culture. And so they're bringing the music of that part of the world here and thinking that, you know, we can unify people through culture. Uh, she was a famous Latin American folk singer. She also wrote for the New York Times and the London Times. So she was uh, quite a character. Ferdinand uh, was... Uh, not quite as flamboyant, he, but he was, uh, among his, his jobs, and when he was, uh, you know, as Ann was growing up, he taught at Columbia University, uh, New York University, and several colleges in New Jersey. So Ann was a young world traveler, and when she was five years old, her parents took her on a freighter to Central America, and it was called the Santa Lucia Freighter. And uh, the purpose of the trip was for her mom to research music again in Central America. And this one uh, opportunity they had this, um, to go ashore, the boat couldn't make it ashore. It was, there was no good wharf there, and the, there was really choppy, stormy water. And the only way to get ashore was to get into a chair and be lowered over the edge by a boom. And uh, Anne's mom said to her, come on, honey, this will be fun. Let's do it. And so Anne and her mom did it, and they were the only people on the whole boat that did that. So, um, so they did it. So my, the earliest writing that I found from Anne, she was writing about this trip. She's six years old, and so I'm going to read you this excerpt that I found. This is, um, every evening, Mommy fixed my hair like Snow White and let me wear one of my best dresses for dinner. 
I wore my party shoes every night, too. In the afternoons, Mommy let me have a bottle of Coca-Cola. That was delicious. <laughs> I love Coca-Cola so much. The first place that Santa Lucia stopped was Panama. Before we left home, my kindergarten teacher gave me a pair of dark glasses that fit me just right. And I had to wear them all the time in Panama because the sunshine was so bright that I had to squint. Daddy bought me a brown belt made out of an alligator. He said we might see an alligator and that sometimes they bite people like bad dogs, only harder. <laughs> so if you knew Anne, you knew she loved Coca-Cola to her dying day, and that would certainly not be her last trip to Panama. Uh, Anne grew up uh, in Montclair, New Jersey, playing under trees in her yard. She really yearned for adventure, and she would ask her parents for stout boots and a, and a BB gun, and she would get ballet shoes and stockings. Uh, she wanted to be an Indian, and uh, she would climb up uh, this pine tree. I think it's over to the right in the picture. She would climb up this pine tree at night, and she would look and avert her eyes from the lights of New York City and look towards the darkness of the New Jersey Pine Barrens and really yearn to be out there in the countryside. And she even climbed that tree as a late teenager. She attended private girls school in high school, uh, regular public school and uh, up to I think about eighth grade. Uh, she, her parents divorced when she was 16 years old. And she stayed behind and she finished her senior year at the Kimberly School for Girls. And uh, after her senior year, her mom wanted her to come down. Her mom, after her parents divorced, her mom moved down to Miami. And uh, she writes this to her mom. You know, her mom's asking her to come down to Miami, and she writes this. I run across, and never threw anything away. So she said, in this, this letter I ran across, I'd like to come down if I can go camping in the Everglades, really dive for treasure, wear shorts and dungarees, and not have to be fancy. Could I really dive? If I find treasure, can I keep it? So she's really like, she's all about treasure hunting. And then I actually ran across, she actually bought stock in a treasure hunting company in Miami. She bought $10 in stock. And I looked it up, the company's actually still in business. So she was serious about this treasure hunting. So here's uh, more about uh, Kate Thornhill. Um, her mom, when she went to Miami, she wanted to start a whole new life. And she took it to you know, t almost to extremes, I think. She changed her name to Kate Thornhill, uh, Kate in honor of her mother. And uh, she started her own business, shipping livestock and racehorses, that, but that was one of the only, th that, not the only thing she did. She then became the only woman stevedore on the docks uh, in, the whole in the whole country, but she was on the docks of Miami as a contract stevedore. And if, if, if this is a term you're not uh, familiar with, I don't want to insult anybody, but they work under a contract and they boss the um, dock hands around to um, load and unload boats on the, on the docks. And uh, she brought her training and language to good use because she could swear at those guys in a whole bunch of different languages. <laughs> and many of them were um, Cuban workers, and when they were lagging too much, she would yell at them, Fila Cuba! And they would just, like, they would just work like crazy. So. So uh, like Anne, uh, she, she was an environmentalist and she spearheaded a cleanup of the Miami River, which <laughs> caused her a lot of grief, um, tire slashing and death threats and just, you know, general little things like that. <laughs> she, uh, she learned to operate a tugboat and that's how she earned the nickname Tugboat Kate. And she was described as really wacky, flamboyant, um, just really kind of out there. But again, you know, like I said, she wanted these jobs that were so different from anything else that she ever did. She took a job uh, taking care of reptiles, and she would bring them to TV shows. And there'd be like these TV shows that, you know, with these exotic animals, and they would have to go in the middle of the night. There were snakes and reptiles and all this. So one of the jobs that they had to do, they had to feed 600 baby alligators, and they had to do it in the middle of the night. But her mom was kind of a socialite, and so she would be sometimes in evening attire, having entertained some international guest or something, and then she and Anne in their fancy clothes would go in the lab and feed the 600 baby alligators. <laughs> so so uh, there was a real contrast, though. Her mom, Anne's mom, Irma, 
was really adventurous and brave. And I think you could say she really was outside of the typical female mold for the 1950s and early 1960s. She did not let Anne drive until she was 19. If you ever saw how Anne drove, that was a really good thing. But um, it wasn't for that reason. Uh, she never let Anne camp out. And she would always tell Anne, girls don't wear pants. Uh, girls don't camp out. Girls don't this. Girls don't that. And yet she was living the, you know, outside the box life as, you know, a stevedore and a, you know, and a, a tugboat operator and, you know, you name it, she was out there doing it. So, so Anne and her mom had a, you know, bit of a difficult life. I think what we see here are two very strong-willed and independent women. But Anne was really shy and quiet and her mom was really flamboyant and outgoing. And they had, you know, a difficult relationship. And so I, I know, I'm sure, without even, the, the picture says it all, her mom had this Carmen Miranda get up, and I'm sure she got Anne to put it on. Did you see how happy Anne is about this? <laughs> so um, Anne had, uh, there was only one woman Anne knew about that was, had an outdoor nature type job, and that was Dr. Eugenie Clark. Uh, she wrote, had wrote a pop, written a popular book called Woman with a Spear. She was a marine biologist, and she was doing research on sharks and poisonous fishes for the U.S. Navy, and she was uh, also she was a researcher at a Woods Hole Institute in in um, Massachusetts. So she was a role model for Anne, and the only one that she had at the time. Excuse me, I'm just going to grab a, a swig. I, this is my hillbilly bottle here. <laughs> grab a swig, hillbilly style. Yes. So Anne was indeed a trailbreaker, and you've heard that tonight. She, here at Cornell, she got her bachelor's. She loved the field work. She loved the chainsaws. She loved you know, the, the transits and the trap lines. And then it comes time to senior research project, and she is told, the professor she had at the time told her, you have to do library or museum work. Well, she refused. That was BS. She didn't want any part of that, and she had to fight to do field work. And then uh, the professor then told her she was going to become an erotic old maid. <laughs> and then there, there was a complaint here. There was a complaint at this fine university that this blonde-haired you know, woman with the pigtails ran around with a pack basket and bare feet, and how could you possibly let her do that? And apparently the dean at the time said, she gets straight A's. She's interested. What's your problem? You know? So when it came time to uh, get jobs, uh, the only jobs she could find were office work. And she kept getting told, no, you're a woman. No outdoor work for you. Uh, she was really passionate about having an outdoor career. And she got her bachelor's here in 1955. So this is you know, almost 60 years ago. So a lot has changed in that time. But she watched her male friends and students go off to become forest rangers and wardens and the only job she could get was behind a desk in, in Florida, you know, t uh, talking to people about where they could go, uh, where some guy could take them on a, on a hike. So she, um, I found a diary, and her diary entry was, um, her life's fight was going to be for her and other women to be allowed to have outdoor careers. And she would either fight and win or die failing in the fight. So she was that passionate. I also found, scratched out, her first uh, will. It was notes in this very diary. And it said her final wish was for her Audubon supervisor to hire the first female tour operator. The next summer, she became Audubon Society's first female tour operator. Now, of course, they made her wear skirts, a hat, fancy shoes. And she begged them and cajoled them. And if you knew Anne, she could beg and cajole until she would just wear you down and finally just say, okay. So she cajoled them for weeks. So they finally allowed her to wear pants and flat shoes. And um, so she did. And here is a picture of her uh, in the, I'm going to say, late 50s, mid, yeah, late 50s, with the National Audubon Society wet, um, station wagon. And she's doing work in Florida. She led tours of the Everglades and some uh, in the Florida Keys and some parks down in Florida. So she was there. Um, that was her first conservation job that she was allowed to be outdoors. 
Uh, and she then she applied, after that, she applied to all conservation organizations in the country, and she was allowed one job, and it was non-paying. And it was, in, it was in Wyoming. So, uh, in fact, the first, and then she had started writing. And in fact, the very first um, outdoor articles that she tried to get written kept getting rejected because she would put them in and la Bastille. She finally put in an article under Al, actually, it was Anne Labastille or Aunt Al Bowes. She put one in, that was her married name a little bit later. And I actually have it open here. You can actually see for your very own eyes that she had to publish under a man's name in order to get published in an outdoor magazine. So I think there's a lot of contrast from there to today. She was uh, only the second female natural resource student here at Cornell. Uh, when I went to school, um, I graduated from college in 1981, about 20% of us were women. And I think the uh, statistic now is 50% or more of the students in natural resources are female. So, you know, we've come a long way in about 80 years, or 60 years. I, she, uh, Adirondacks, marriage and hard work. When Anne was working in Florida, she met um, and fell in love with Major uh, Claude Vernon Bowes. Uh, he was 14 years her senior. Uh, so she went and lived in the Adirondacks. First, she, he invited her to come work at his uh, place in the Adirondacks, Covid Lodge, near Big Moose. And he said, do you want to work in the kitchen? No. Do you want to wait table? No. Do you want to you know, uh, uh, do chambermaid? No. And he goes, OK, do you want to tend the horses? Yes. She was all over it. So here's an early picture of her at Covid Lodge, uh, all gussied up, you know, taking care of the horses. And then in the lower right-hand corner, her husband and her, and then a, a brochure that was for Adirondack Life, or um, Adirondack COVID Lodge. So uh, it was uh, hard work. Uh, she married in 1956, and her husband encouraged her to go back to college to get her master's degree. He was really supportive of her doing that. So uh, she did go back to college. And she went to Colorado uh, State University, and she got her master's in 1961. But before that happened, she applied to 12 universities for a master's program. And in virtually all instances, women were confined to literature searches only. Literature searches only. No field work. No field work. Only Colorado would allow field work. So she got a scholarship at Colorado, uh, offered a scholarship at Colorado State. Because she insisted on doing field work, they rescinded the scholarship. And she said, you could take your damn scholarship. I'm doing field work. So she did field work. And she, um, in 19, it was the uh, ecological analysis of mule deer range, um, Kashla Pruja Canyon in Colorado. And in 1987, she took me with her to a world uh, wilderness conference. And she took me to where she did her field work. And I could just really sense the the pride that she had in the work that she did. And so, you know, she really wanted me to see that. Uh, she and her husband uh, led, at the same time she's working on her bachelor or her master's degree, they're running this in in the summertime. She and her husband ran the first eco tours out of the United States. They bought a 57 foot boat called the Snowbird, and it was based out of Miami. And they lived on that boat in the winters, sometimes. And they would take a lot of the same people that were coming to their uh, lodge in the summertime were going on these uh, tours through Latin America and the Caribbean in the wintertime. And it was, um, there were no breaks from the tourists years around and year round, and it was really tough and working on her master's. But she did, um, she and her husband were, um, are credited with leading the first ecotourism. And now, of course, ecotourism is quite a big thing. Here's a picture of um, back from the 50s, the eco tours. One of them. So uh, life was tough for her and her husband with all of the demands. And she had started writing, and she really, really yearned to write. And she was able to sequester herself away on Sunday afternoons and write. But it just became too much. And they did end up getting divorced. And uh, the year between 1964 and 1965 were very difficult for her. Her father died. Um, she divorced. And, but this was also an opportunity. She had long dreamed of having, building herself a thorough type cabin. And she found property on a lake in the western Adirondacks that had no road to it, no electricity, no running water. And she, uh, with help, 
built a log cabin. And she broke ground in May 1964 and moved in on July 4th, which was, if you know uh, Henry David Thoreau, that's the day he moved in his Thoreau cabin in Concord. So um, she cut no logs from her own land. She was this real purist. She actually had logs brought in and floated down the lake and hoisted up and made into the cabin. But it never had uh, running water or um, well, she had some funky little system where she could pump water up to a stock tank and it ran down, but it didn't last very long. It broke down and that was that. So she never had electricity, running water, or plumbing. She did finally, when she first got there, there were no, no phone lines. She did get a telephone uh, put in there when lines came through. Otherwise, it was a citizen band radio. Uh, she failed to read the fine print on her um, deed. And in fact, she built the cabin too close to the water. And October of that year, it had to be moved back 30 feet and it, uh, if you read Woods Woman, she tells about that, but they moved back on greased logs. So, and then she took this opportunity to return to um, Cornell for her PhD, and she, there was a, a bird in Lake Atitlan that just called to her. She and her husband had seen it when they were in Guatemala and had inquired a little bit about it and found out that this giant flightless grebe of Guatemala had never really been studied. So she um, did move into her cabin, and so I, one of the treasures I found uh, is her actual cabin log, and I'm going to have this here. It's actually, I don't know if anybody here ever went up there birding or anything, but there's lists of birds that people wrote down. So this goes from 1964 when she broke ground to the 1980s, and there's uh, a lot of pictures, but I'm going to just read a little something. And if you ever read Woods Woman and you look at some of the excerpts in here, you see it just gets taken right into Woods Woman. So this is her, and this is written November 29, 1964. There's a strong east wind. It melts the ice again with rain. A symphony is playing between the rain, the wind, and the temperature to see who will bring the silence to the water's music or who will permit it to play just a little longer. Back and forth, back and forth. Meanwhile, we humans switch from boat to trail with sighs. A harder life, yet rewarding in its own way. It's fundamental. You're back in the strength in your legs, and the wind now dictate what you wear, eat, and carry. So it's a nice little treasure from her cabin. So. so she split her time. Uh, a lot of folks think that she lived in that cabin year-round. In fact, she did not. She stayed until uh, Christmas time, the first year, and she would stay into the winter time and she would check on it in the winter, but she never lived in that cabin year round. She split her time between uh, travels and her research work in Guatemala. So here she wrote uh, Woods Woman about living in the cabin, and, but that was, uh, that's her in her cabin with her manual typewriter. She never used an electric typewriter and, and couldn't abide the idea of touching a computer. So. So she did everything. She would handwrite. She had all these yellow uh, legal size pads, handwrite every manuscript, and she never threw anything away. So there's tons of manuscripts, all handwritten and then scribbled out. And then the next one was typed. So you know, you get a few handwritten manuscripts and a few typed ones. So she studied the giant grebe of Lake Atitlan. It was flightless, it was only at Lake Atitlan. And she, um, it was in severe decline. and. Uh, it had not been researched, had never been photographed, and its life, life history had not been described. So uh, she and her husband, when they were there, had done a quick census on it, and that was it. So she returned back to uh, work on that project. Should have known that she would be an ornithologist, a picture of her with a little stuffed bird when she's, uh, I don't know, five years old, and uh, with an emaciated juvenile grebe in um, Guatemala. So she conducted this research, and she, um, she uh, got established the first wildlife preserve. And so I'm not going to you know, spend a whole lot of time on this, but she worked really closely engaging the local people and worked at all levels of the government, just across the board. They investigated habitat issues as to why this bird was failing, and they conducted education and outreach. They did an annual census. and. Um, the focus with the local people in Guatemala was not on preserving a bird for bird's sake, but on national pride and tourism. And I think those are lessons that we, you know, will have today as well. Uh, it, one of the projects that happened was um, there were paintings that were commissioned, and there, uh, these are not the 
paintings that were commissioned by the government, but their uh, paintings were commissioned by the government, and they were used to make postage stamps. And I actually have um, commemorative uh, bird postage stamps here that were made uh, from the paintings. They were, to date, the most successful, uh, um, what do you call those, kind of special stamps in Guatemala ever. So, so those are pictures of the stamps. So uh, Anne's do, working on her PhD thesis, but she darn nearly quit the PhD program because she couldn't stand it, needed one year of residence. She'd been, you know, so free in her travels and stuff. And so she he was here in Cornell. She was lonely. She hated the dorm life. And she was just, you know, this close to quitting that PhD program. And this kind professor realized that she was in crisis and she needed to be talked to. So he, pull, he can cancels his meetings, pulls her in, and he said, Anne, your PhD is going to be your ticket to the future. It's going to give you respect and credibility. Take a year off and come back. And so she did just that. She went straight away to Guatemala, uh, five years to do her PhD research. Five years later, she had her PhD, and she had spearheaded Guatemala's first wildlife preserve. It was, uh, and then from there on, it was 25 years of passion, hard work, and commitment. Unfortunately, that bird did become extinct, and there were a lot of factors, socioeconomic uh, and natural factors, and probably the last and final nail in the coffin was an earthquake that opened up cracks in the bottom of Lake Atitlan, drained water, the uh, water level fell so fast, and the, um, the reed habitat went away. They're really dependent on reed habitat, but there's the whole uh, you know, development, civil war, habitat destruction, invasive species, and then natural forces. So she uh, d did write uh, a book called Mama Pock, and that was, it's probably the only known 25-year uh, study and full um, investigation of a bird that became extinct. So you heard um, Jim Lasoy mention uh, an NGO uh, in about 2000. Anne and some others started a new uh, NGO. It was called Save Atitlan. And it, was, it lasted a few years, and it was aimed at habitat restoration, you know, because the grebe is gone, but there's still stuff that could be done. Stabilizing slopes, planting native species, addressing raw sewage, and then reaching out to and talking with uh, the uh, Mayan women who wash their clothes in the water of the lake right next to raw sewage. So it was uh, to train um, health care workers. And I think you'll recognize a familiar face. There's a Dr. Lasoy with Ruth and Anne up there in that picture. Uh, professor Labastille, she became Cornell's first female natural resource professor. She taught for two years, and I ran across some film, and I had print, uh, neg uh, the uh, negatives printed up. It turns out she uh, took a bunch of pictures of her students, so maybe somebody will recognize those students. Um, she taught just for those two years, and she realized that academia wasn't for her, and so she then really, truly learned the value of her PhD. She um, started uh, international environmental consulting. And she, one of the first jobs she did, she gets dropped on a beach in Anadega, British Virgin Islands. And um, she, she has to uh, find water. She's dropped with no water and a grad student. And she's supposed to do the first biological survey. But she did a lot of the very first uh, environmental, you know, biological surveys, environmental surveys of parks that were proposed in Panama, Dominican Republic, British Virgin Islands, and the Amazon. And that's a picture from early on, uh, slash and burn in the, in the Amazon. Uh, this book, uh, Jaguar Totem, chronicles, uh, or, yeah, chronicles her various adventures in environmental consulting and field work. And uh, she would sometimes serve as the guest lecturer on these, these uh, ecological cruises. In 1993, she was a staff ecologist on the MS Polaris Special Expedition to Panama. And uh, she decides she sees a Chaco Indian woman painting another woman. She decides, you know, to do that to me too. So she gets this on, and then she zooms back, and she gets on the boat. Just the boat's, the tides drop, and she runs out, gets on the boat, and uh, I think the next night was the last night on this boat, and she's got this paint on her face, and there's the fancy dinner, you know, that they have always on these boats, and um, 
she tried all kinds of hazardous chemicals to get that thing <laughs> off her face. And so then she, in exasperation, she goes to the ship's muse, uh, library. She looks this stuff up. It's something called um, Ginepa Americana tree, and it says it cannot be removed. It lasts 10 days. Well, so then she goes to this fancy thing, all dressed up in a white dress, fancy shoes, a hair all up, and her tiger face. <laughs> so, so, so then she comes home, you know, she, she comes home, it lasted three weeks, and she, on her face the whole time that she has many layovers and flights back from Panama through, you know, landing at Albany Airport and all that, so she's got this stuff on for, th for three weeks. <laughs> Uh, she was an author, as you know, as you know. I mean, twelve books, uh, starting with *Woods Woman*, is probably the most popular. But uh, she had uh, quite a number of books, and I'll just call out uh, one of them. She, as again, you know, manual typewriter, handwritten notes, never electric. And in the steps of her grandfather Julius Gobel, she collected uh, folk tales of um, the Maya, and she writes um, *Birds of the Maya*. And this is songs and folk tales of the Maya, plus the birds that are down there. Uh, in the Mayan, in primarily Guatemala, Central America, and then tells about, the folk tales are about the birds that are in here. So there's that, that thread, remember there's that thread that keeps going through, which is storytelling and collecting folk tales. She became uh, Adirondack Park Agency Commissioner. She was the first person ever to um, be a commissioner at APA with a science background. She truly introduced science to decision making in the Adirondacks, and she initiated the Ecology Committee, she was there for, what is that, um, 18 years it looks like, 17, 18 years. Uh, unfortunately, in the uh, mid-90s, there was uh, the equivalent, the Adirondack equivalent of the Sagebrush Rebellion. There was this huge property rights movement. There were um, log trucks that were slowing down traffic on the Northway, et cetera, et cetera. And there were um, threats and um, arson, death threats. She got death threats. There was... Um, uh, graffiti and vandalism on, I think it was the uh, Adirondack Council's office and another office happened, I think something happened to APA. Well, somebody burned down her barn. In the meantime, she had about 1988, 1989, she'd bought a farm in Westport because it gave her a nice home base. She could work there. She was close to the Adirondacks. She wasn't too far from Albany. So she had this really nice farm with a beautiful barn and she had electricity and running water, all the things that you know, civilized people have and what she really needed to be doing her work. And somebody came and burned her barn and she was so badly shaken that I never heard her and I don't think she did. She never could risk being as outspoken and as much of an advocate as she was before then. She just couldn't risk it because she got death threats and somebody burned her barn. So, you know, so 1992 was about the last that she really was, you know, out there. It didn't mean that she didn't continue to make contributions. She very much did, but she wasn't as, you know, she, what, she didn't dare to be as outspoken as she was. So it was really, you know, kind of a, a tragedy. Uh, she was a charter member of... Um, the newly revamped New York State Guides Association was a guide. Um, she and I co-instructed for uh, a couple years at uh, Sagamore in Racket Lake, the Women in Wilderness, or the Wilderness Woman Weekend. That's a picture of her and me um, by a wood pile. And um, I got a job just out of college as a wilderness ranger. And Ann and I had been, you know, I knew her. We'd been communicating back and forth. But she heard that I was doing that job. And she actually, that fall, she reaches out to me when she's done, gets back in town. She's done with her field work. And she said, you know, most of the time people are talking about what I'm doing. Now everybody's talking about what you're doing. It's time we got to know each other better. So she invited me um, to spend a weekend with her, help her catch up on stuff. And so we became really, we became good friends. And uh, she wanted to join me as a wilderness, you know, when I was doing my patrol. I was by myself patrolling a 50,000 acre wilderness in the Adirondacks. And so it was so much fun. We were these, this real study in contrast. So here we were, she would hike with her bare feet and her painted toenails, and I had hiking boots. She had these ratty jeans or ratty cutoffs, and no shirt, but it was a pink or a leopard bra. I had this sharp you know, uniform with fancy patches. Uh, she took, you know, those like um, egg, egg crate roll-up mats. 
she would take one of those, roll it all up, and tie it to her pack, and it would just flop along. And I had this really tight, you know, closed cell foam, and it was on top, and it was in its own little case. It was all really tight. So she'd have this thing flopping along. <laughs> she had her camera dangling from her pack, and it was just bang, bang, bang all the time. And then we get to the uh, to camp in, and and I'd whip out my little backpack and stove and get it going. She'd you know, make her wood fire. And so she always kidded me about, you know, using non-renewable resources. And I just kid her about having to walk a lot further to get her fuel. So, you know, we just had a lot of uh, fun. And um, one time uh, we were camping in the Moose River Plains and we were working on her Ponds of the Plains article, getting pictures and things. And she was, as usual, driving faster than she could. And if you ever got a letter from her, it was all, it was all like jiggity. I said, eh, what's up with that? You know, she has bad handwriting anyway. Oh, I write all my letters while I'm driving. That's the only time I have time. So, so she's a bad driver anyway. So, so she, we're, we're flying through the Moose River Plains. It's this dirt road. We go around this bend, and there's a, there's a campsite on the bend, and we go peel it almost right through their campsite. There's these two guys, and they just, like, get their huge eyes, and they back up and run away. And then she turns around, she looks at me, and she passes, did I scare you, dear? Like, so we had a lot of fun and, and mutual respect. Uh, Anne had a guiding mentor. His name was uh, Bob Burkhart. And uh, he was, he uh, and she would spend at least one day a week uh, hiking, and he, he uh, showed her all around uh, her piece of the Adirondacks. Um, and I found, uh, just last week actually, I found a picture of her, 1959, 1960. She's a guide in training, and that's her out in the Independence River country. She won a number of awards for conservation literature, uh, many awards, and she was particularly proud of the World Wildlife Fund um, uh, Award. She won the gold medal uh, in 1974 for Conservationist of the Year by the World Wildlife Fund, um, and she was really, really proud of the Roger Tory Peterson Award for um, Nas National Educator. I have, and you are welcome to come and look at it, I have her gold medal from the World Wildlife Fund, and she won this gold medal and a uh, Rolex watch, and I have a gold medal from the, the Society for Women Geographers. But so, so you, I will have these with me, and you can come and see them afterwards. So all this notoriety, people really figured out where she was, and this was before the days of GPS and all that. So she wrote Woods Woman, and men fall in love with her, and women fall in love with her, and everybody's trying to find her, and you know, so she left enough clues that if you um, put together a bunch of topo maps, you might be able to figure it out. So people did figure it out, and she started getting uninvited company and, like, bottles of wine left on her dock and all this and that. So she, um, her admirers sort of went to extremes to find her, and, you know, she is a very private person. So, the, and there were more camps and more boats on Black Bear Lake. And so she pushed to the back of her property, and she built this for less than $200. She builds this Thoreau II. And this is on the back side. It's a half mile nasty bushwhack. And by the time you get there, it feels like you walk five miles. So she builds that to, to, build, to make herself a little writing retreat. And this was her right hand man, Rodney. He's well into his 80s when he's helping her, but he, he helped her a lot, and he. Uh, you know, there he is with the chainsaw, so that's, that's Mr. Rodney. Good, just really old-time guide, just nice. So I'm just going to flash through a bunch of uh, slides just so you can enjoy him, sort of Anne at home and uh, her cabin, pictures from her cabin. This is her farm at Westport. Um, her farm at Westport, you see what happened to the barn before and after. Uh, this picture I love, it's her young in the canoe. And then if you look, you can see um, in the picture on the right, she's about 74 years old. She has just the same smile and the same young face. It's uh, maybe about three years before she died in the guide boat. Um, and she didn't do all this by herself. She had the help of friends. And the guy on the left is John Miller from across the lake, and the guy on the right is my beloved dad. Uh, that's Anne and me out on the ice checking her cabin. And Anne um, had a lifelong love of dogs, and she was absolutely leader of the pack.
So and she finally did get a cat. <coughs> so Anne did um, become ill, and she did need long-term care. And her last uh, dog was Krispy Kreme. And so when Anne went into long-term care, I remembered that Anne had asked me about 25 years before if anything should ever happen to her, would I take her, whatever dog she had at the time? And I, I said yes to her. Well, when I found out that she had to go into long-term care, I couldn't just do this. So I went home and we talked it over at dinner that night. And um, some folks know that um, we have an adopted little girl. And um, when I told the story at dinner table, my, our little girl said, you gave me a forever home. Krispy Kreme needs a forever home. We need to do this. So Krispy Kreme now lives with us. And this is our, our daughter. And with our two dogs, Krispy Kreme is the German Shepherd. And Krispy Kreme uh, did, does have a good life. Uh, she went backpacking a couple times with us. So that we became Krispy Kreme's new forever home. And we would take Krispy up to CN, up in Lake uh, Plattsburgh. And when Anne died, we had a two-day sort of drop-in memorial service at the lake where her cabin is. And uh, she, she had a vision, and it was to preserve um, her cabin and her property as Forever Wild, where she found inspiration in the Adirondacks. It was to establish a writer's retreat, and it was to, um, she wanted a, a new nonprofit started, and she wanted, obviously, this uh, Woodsman Scholarship at Cornell. So it became my job to deliver her wishes. And so there were some easy, simple ones, which were small gifts. And then there were some that weren't so easy and simple. And so I'm going to share with you the Labastiel Legacy <laughs> Projects. And I have to, at this time, really um, to, uh, say thank you to Cornell, because I would not be able to do the legacy projects that I'm describing on Anne's behalf if Cornell University did not agree to waive a little bit of uh, the funding that it would have gotten otherwise. So thank you, Cornell. You're allowing me to do the whole package. So uh, this, I, I started a Memorial Writers Residency. It's a partnership with the Community Foundation of Herkimer and Oneida County and the Adirondack Center for Writing. It's funded $300,000 endowment. Uh, the first Adirondack, uh, the first Writers Residency was held last month, early last month, it was a huge success. They're, they had a competitive process, 80-some-odd uh, applicants, six people got slots. It was held at a restored lodge right on the lake where her cabin is, which is Twitchell Lake. Uh, that's a picture of uh, the writers. There were six of them won their slots around the fireplace at her cabin, and then a picture of one of the recipients. Uh, her cabin is going to the Adirondack Museum. Uh, this week uh, was scheduled to start deconstruction of her cabin. Uh, so the cabin and a $300,000 endowment go to the Adirondack Museum. The Adirondack Museum is engaged in a wholesale revisioning of what they are, and they're going to be completely redoing their dis uh, exhibits. And they're super excited about this acquisition, and it's going to be a focal point um, of their new, uh, what they're calling the Adirondack experience. So that's all going to be in place by the end of 2017. And the work, uh, her cabin's going to be dismantled this fall, and the uh, log skidded down the ice. And uh, I expect that it's probably going to be rebuilt before 2017. A land donation, her property is, and this is the first time this is being announced publicly, uh, I have arranged to donate her property to New York State. Uh, she wanted it to be forever wild. Uh, and it, it will be annexed to the Pigeon Lake Wilderness Area. So this is actually looking from her Thoreau 2 cabin actually into the Pigeon Lake Wilderness Area. Her property butts right up onto Pigeon Lake Wilderness Area. So um, it will remain exactly what she wanted, which is forever wild. And of course, we have our Woodswoman Scholarship. So uh, Anne uh, would have been 81 tomorrow. Tomorrow would be her birthday. Oh, sorry about that. So I just wanted to, and uh, in her wishes, she had, um, she said any uh, tribute that she had, she had certain things that wanted to be read. So I, if you will indulge me a moment, I'll just read a poem that she wanted. It's Barter by Sarah Truesdale. Life has loveliness to sell, all beautiful and splendid things. Blue waves, 
whitened on a cliff, soaring fire that sways and sings, in children's faces looking up, holding wonder like a cup. Life has loveliness to sell, music like the curve of gold, scent of the pines in the rain, eyes that love you and arms that hold. And for your spirits still delight, holy thoughts that start the night. Spend all you have for loveliness, buy it and never count the cost. For one white singing hour of peace, count for many a year of strife well lost. And for a breath of ecstasy, give all you have been or could be. And so I think the legacy will continue. Uh, this young lady, my daughter, uh, chose Woods Woman as her uh, backpack reading material. So, <laughs> so I, I would, uh, at this point, I would like to invite, I think John Fitzpatrick is here. Is John? Yeah, come up, sir. Can you? So John Fitzpatrick is the director of the Lab of Ornithology. I haven't had the opportunity to meet him. Hi, John. Oh, Leslie Serpent. Really, really Thank you. Beautiful. So uh, I, on behalf of the estate of Anne LaBastille, I, I'm donating these uh, Grebe paintings. These were uh, done by Guatemalan natives. And these will, they uh, belong in the lab. They don't belong uh, in some box where I would be keeping them. So, so these are yours. And as well as uh, stamps that were made from not from those paintings, but from other paintings. So here's the here are the commemorative stamps. Next to the, uh, next to the paintings. Beautiful. Yep. And here's a little blurb on what those stamps were, and you can still find Fantastic. that. So. Fantastic. Thanks so much. You're welcome. So, thank you. So, do you come up now? And I've got a gift for you. <laughs> I have a two signed copies of Jaguar Totem for the first two recipients of the scholarship. Oh, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for your Yeah, you're Good. welcome. Good. Good. Good, thanks. I guess we should say thank you to all our guest speakers, especially to Leslie for coming a long way and being with us in this wonderful presentation today. So why don't we do that? Anymore?